Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space Updates. I'm Sean Deville, joined as always by Blaine Carcio. In this episode, we discuss China's future space ambitions through the lens of their latest space white paper. But first, let's talk about what looks like a Chinese version of relativity space. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So are we seeing the birth of a Chinese version of Relativity Space? Relativity Space, as you know, is a U.S.-based company in California, which is known to exploit additive manufacturing, also known as 3D printing, to build rockets. While 3D printing is now more and more common practice for making rocket parts, especially complex rocket engine parts, Relativity Space is rather unique in the sense that they plan to fully 3D print their rockets. And this has multiple advantages, according to the company. This helps with automating the manufacturing process, lowering labor costs, and also lowering manufacturing lead times. It helps them with uh, faster iterations between different rocket designs. It simplifies the supply chain. And more basically, it enables them to print pieces that would have been otherwise too complex or even impossible to manufacture in a traditional way. Now, how is all this related to China? Chinese launch companies, regardless of if we're talking about the state-owned Long March rockets or the commercial companies like iSpace, Landspace, or Galactic Energy, they generally all use 3D printing to some degree, but it's for targeted parts. And this is also generally the case outside of China for other rocket companies. Really, it's very rare to see launch companies that are all in on 3D printing like Relativity Space. Very rare, but not non-existent. And it seems like we may be witnessing yet another Chinese commercial launch company seeing the day in China. And this new kid in town seems to be betting on strategies that are very close to that of relativity space. And we're talking, of course, about Space Tai or Tai Han Hang Tian. This company was founded in March 2021. It's based in Shanghai and Xi'an. It's barely one year old, and it's one of the most recent Chinese commercial launch companies to sort of join the already very crowded pool of 15 to 20 commercial launch companies in China that are all fighting to get a piece of the satellite launch market cake. Now, Space Thai has announced that over 90% of their rockets would be 3D printed, and this includes the engines naturally, but also the entire body of the rocket. And this figure of 90% is similar to Relativity Space, which I believe 3D prints its rockets up to 95%. Space Tie is planning two rockets. You have the Phaetian and the much larger Phaetian X. Phaetian is a two-stage medium lift rocket putting four tons into LEO. It has a diameter of 3.8 meters, and it will be powered on the first stage by nine Kerlox engines called Xiao Yi, while the upper stage will have a single vacuum-optimized version of the same engine. Now, on the other hand, Phaetian X is a heavy lift rocket putting 15 tons into LEO. We don't really know much about the architecture, but it seems like it will be sort of a Falcon heavy architecture. So you take the fate here and there's the body is slightly more elongated, I believe, and two strap on boosters are slapped on for additional thrust. And I believe also that the second stage will have an additional vacuum optimized engine and both rockets Phaetian and Phaetian X are naturally reusable. They perform vertical takeoff, vertical landing. And this now seems to be a standard today when a rocket company, um, you know, proposes a new rocket. And moving on to my next point, at the core of any 3D printing rocket company is the mastery and the design of very complex 3D printing machines that are able to satisfy spaceflight requirements and, of course, the according software. This is the case for Relativity Space, which has Stargate. I believe it's the largest 3D printer in the world. And apparently, SpaceTie has been developing similar printers. You have a much more modest printer called the Xingchen S480, and SpaceTie has created a 3D printing rocket parts production line in Xi'an, and they're also developing the much larger Shinkong W450, which will be able to print pieces that are 4.5 meters by 4 meters. I think that's still significantly below Relativity Space's Stargate, which can print pieces, I believe, up to 11 meters tall. But, you know, the Shinkong W450, this seems like a very good starting point for space time to start to print entire rocket bodies. Now, the million-dollar question here, how likely is any of this 
to take place to happen? And I think this is a very hard question to answer. This company is just barely one year old. Um, they did say that they planned the maiden launch of the Phaetian rocket in 2024. I think this sounds a little bit overambitious considering the time that it took Relativity Space to go from the founding of the company in 2015 all the way to the maiden launch of their first rocket, the Terrain 1, which I think is to take place in the coming months. In terms of pricing, Space High said that the manufacturing of each rocket should be below 10 million RMB or roughly 1.5 million US dollars. And this, honestly, this sounds dirt cheap. That's 375 US dollars per kilogram into space. Now, admittedly, this is the manufacturing cost. It does not factor in any of the other costs. But I think that even if this cost goes 10x, if you factor in the other costs, this is still a very cheap price per kilogram, especially for a small to medium lift launch vehicle. So it'll be very interesting to see if Space High will be able to maintain these prices as they, you know, as they um, move forward with their R&D and as they approach commercialization. And final point, I don't think that Space High has raised any funds yet. I wasn't able to find anything at the very least. Um, they did say that they would require 600 million RMB or roughly 100 million US dollars to go from their current situation all the way to the maiden launch in 2024. This sum does not seem like a lot. I mean, you know, as a point of comparison, one of their domestic competitors, Galactic Energy, raised twice that amount in a single round. And that was a couple of weeks ago. So I think one of the factors that could explain this is that Space Tie is also planning to start a rocket parts 3D printing business in 2023. And so this could bring in an additional stream of revenue. And so I don't have that much more on Space Tie. They're still a very new company. So um, I guess we'll be following them very closely and keeping you updated in the coming months. And uh, yeah, with that, Blaine, shall we move on to the Space White paper or any thoughts on Space Tie 3D printing or relativity space. Yeah, so I guess just a little bit more on uh, on relativity space and then uh, some some speculation on, on the nature of, of their business plan and how it may impact space tie. Um, so first of all, I think it's interesting to note that investors in, in the US or I guess in, in the West in general, uh, they seem to take 3D printing rockets quite seriously with relativity space having raised their most recent round of uh, $650 million of, of funding in June of 2021 at a valuation of 4.2 billion US dollars. So I mean, it we don't know if any of the Chinese launch companies are, you know, are valued at more than a billion U.S. dollars, for for example. But generally, well, when we've seen companies in China cross that threshold, they have expressed that publicly by saying they're a unicorn, such as Galaxy Space. And none of the Chinese companies have done so. None of the Chinese launch companies have done so thus far. But but digressing, Relativity Space with their 3D printing technology, apparently investors have a fair amount of, of faith in, in the technology. Um, and then I guess getting back to, to one of John's earlier points about um, the, the time it's taken for Relativity Space to develop their rocket and, and kind of... The the fact that they've still not launched um, and, and the, sort of the, the complication or the difficulties of 3D printed technology. Um, I think one of the interesting bits of speculation that we've heard about in the U.S. launch market is that Relativity Space with the CEO, uh, Tim Ellis, having spent a few years working at Blue Origin in different positions, um, are kind of angling to be acquired by Blue Origin as a kind of an additional technology to integrate into Blue Origin's rocket ambitions. And we've had Jeff Bezos, I think, visit Relativity a couple of times, and, and it always kind of stirs up some media speculation. And so I I think it kind of draws this question of whether 3D printing for rockets is more of a kind of technology that would be integrated into a larger scale rocket manufacturer or whether it is, you know, really possible to build a large scale rocket manufacturer on 3D printed rockets alone. And, uh, you know, not knowing enough about rockets to make an educated decision there, I, I don't really know. But but I think it could be an interesting thing to watch moving forward with space tie, you know, whether they um perhaps kind of similar to Jiuzhou Yundian, um, they act as more of a supplier to systems level rocket manufacturers rather than trying to build their own rockets or, or otherwise, you know, try to commercialize 3D printing technology for rockets more generally rather than necessarily printing their own 3D printed rockets and using that to, you know, sell launch capacity. So, um, yeah, nothing else on space tie, but definitely uh, an interesting thing to see 3D printed rockets becoming a, a thing in China. Um, looking forward to seeing where that goes. So um, steering away from uh, from relativity space and uh, you know U.S. valuations, this week we saw a, a rather large piece of news coming out of the uh, the State Council, the highest level of government in in China. That is the China Space White Paper 2021 edition. It's a five yearly space white paper that summarizes the achievements over the previous five years in China's space program, and then also discusses some of the major tasks over the next five years, uh, some of the policies and regulations that will support those tasks, and then also some international collaboration and other uh, elements of, of China's space program in, in the international sphere. 
this year, I think the first major overarching trend is, you know, more commercialization in, in China's space sector and uh, just this emphasis on, on innovation coming from a broader variety of companies. And so for just a little bit of context, uh, historically, I mean, up until 2014, 2015, the entirety of China's space sector was basically comprised of state owned enterprises, mostly CASC and then literally like more than 100 or you know, let's call it about 100 CASC subsidiaries and sub subsidiaries. And then a couple of other big SOEs, KSIC and CETC and others having a few space focused subsidiaries. But what we've started to see over the last handful of years, really starting in 2014, but but more seriously, even you know, more recently than that, um, is this broadening of that supply chain. So we've started to see at you know the systems level rocket companies, your land spaces and ice spaces coming into the market and doing similar, although smaller scale things to say CALT. Um, but then we've also started to see companies coming in at a subsystems level and this kind of broadening of innovation. So for technologies like 3D printing or for you know liquid methyl ox engines, uh, or laser inter satellite links, we've started to see more commercial companies. And, and I think, again, the white paper really specifies that these commercial companies are, are going to play a bigger role. Um, and I think that, you know, really one of the interesting points uh, in, in this regard is that they specifically mention within this white paper, the Hyperbola 1 and the Series 1 rockets, which are, of course, the two successful commercially launched rockets by iSpace and Galactic Energy, respectively, in, in 2019 and 2020. Again, mentioning these rockets specifically in this very high-level white paper, I think is an example of this increased emphasis on um, on commercialization. And I think ultimately that this this emphasis on commercialization, on opening up to a certain extent, uh, it reflects the importance of space, because I think ultimately for the central government to say this industry is so strategically important and there's such impetus to move quickly in this industry that we're going to a certain extent give up a degree of control and allow these companies to do more stuff. Um, again, I think it, it reflects the strategic importance of space in, in uh, you know, in China today. Um, so getting to kind of the second major high level takeaway, I think more international cooperation and, and international cooperation has been a trend in, in these papers over the last couple of editions. But but I think this year, especially given the complexity of, of China's uh, missions that they're launching, um, international cooperation took on a, a bigger role. And so I think within the paper, you see mention for a few different high level international cooperation projects. And then you also see a handful of, uh, in some cases, rather oddly specific projects as well. So at a high level, in terms of these multinational projects, I think you have the ILRS, the International Lunar Research Station, which is, of course, the joint mission with Russia, but which is open to uh, basically anyone who wants to cooperate. You have the China Space Station, which, of course, the Tianhe core module was launched last year. We have the two lab modules being launched this year and a number of international uh, participants in, in terms of the lab racks on that space station uh, doing different research and, and technology related projects. Um, so again, digressing, um, more international cooperation, I think, is is one of the major trends. And, and just the last point on this and, and kind of in regard to the, the context in which all of this international cooperation would take place, um, the white paper also calls for, quote, safeguarding the central role of the United Nations in managing outer space affairs. And it mentions the UN a number of times throughout the white paper. And this may or may not be a subtle way of saying, you know, no single country uh, can exert a whole lot of influence over outer space affairs, even if that single country is the, the current global hegemon. So uh, I think what we should expect to see over the next five years from China is more international cooperation and more, you know, pressing for these independent kind of multinational organizations like the United Nations uh, having kind of the, the last say over outer space affairs. So I think an interesting area to look at moving forward. And so finally, I think the white paper makes repeated mention of developing applications on China's rapidly expanding space infrastructure. So, it you know, this would be included in constellations like Beidou satellite navigation, also a variety of remote sensing satellites. So the, the Gaofan satellites, notably at Feng Yun for meteorology purposes. As China's space infrastructure has become more sophisticated, as its constellations have become more numerous, um, the type of applications that they can develop has, you know, has become more uh, sophisticated. But also, I guess, the impetus to commercialize them in some way outside of China has become bigger because these are more expensive projects. You know, if they launch a five billion dollar or ten billion dollar low Earth orbit broadband constellation over the next five years, um, it would be quite helpful to be able to sell some communication services outside of. China China to help pay for that five or $10 billion investment. So 
I think this development of applications is is going to be a major trend moving forward. I think we're going to see more companies, um, you know, raising funds saying we are using this money to develop applications on, you know, by whether it's Beidou or whether it's uh, the upcoming Guowang constellation, um, et cetera. And so quite a lot to look forward to over these next few years in, uh, in the Chinese space sector and, and definitely a lot of ambition in the white paper. Uh, and the timing of the publication was interesting in the sense that this week we are moving into a new year, and that being the Year of the Tiger. And so with the Chinese New Year, we saw a couple of greetings from a cast of characters across China's uh, space sector, some of which were uh, were further away than others. And so to get into our last story of the week, uh, we saw a couple of videos sent from uh, from quite quite far away indeed. Uh, so the first video was from the Shenzhou 13 crew that is currently on board the Chinese space station. And so the video sent New Year's greetings from Commander Jai Zhergang, as well as Wang Yaping and Ye Guangfu, and uh, a couple of notes that, that kind of came to mind as watching the video. So the first thing is that there is an impressive amount of, of red paper and other Chinese New Year kind of uh, paraphernalia, given the you know, the expense that it, it, it is to, to launch that to the Chinese space station. So it, uh, it's, it's nice that they were able to, um, you know, to, to launch a fair amount of Chinese New Year stuff to make it a bit festive for the Chinese New Year. Definitely a pretty cool way to, uh, to bring in the new year with this 2021 white paper and with these greetings from, uh, from extremely far away. So, uh, Jean, anything from your side on, uh, on the Chinese space station and, uh, the New Year's greetings? So nothing more on my side. Just want to wish a happy New Year to our Chinese viewers. And all of those other nice, Chinese phrases, um, and we'll see you next week's episode. For sure. A happy new year to all of our East Asian viewers, for sure. And uh, a big thanks to an anonymous uh, anonymous fan on Buy Me A Coffee and also to Andrew McFarland for having gone over to buymeacoffee.com slash Hour and bought us some coffee. So if you like our, uh, our content, do feel free. And uh, with that being said, um, I think that is all for this week. So happy, uh, happy Chinese New Year and um, happy Year of the Tiger. See you next week. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.